Welcome back to the CSS Georgia Dive Barge. I'm Michael Jordan showing you all of the fascinating and uh, high-tech things that U.S. Navy divers and maritime archaeologists working for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Savannah District are doing to raise the wreckage of this 150-year-old warship. Now, take a look over here. Right now, you can see uh, one of the real complications of, of doing business here on the wreck side of the CSS Georgia. Just one of many large vessels that uh, traverse right in front of the dive barge here, very near to where the divers are working, bringing things to and from the port of Savannah, which is one of the busiest container ports in the country. Uh, the divers are not in danger. They have things under control. They do this all the time, but it's still something that they pay close attention to, going very close by. Now, right here beside me is something I want to show you. This is the sonar system that allows the technicians and archaeologists and uh, the master diver to understand very precisely what's happening with the divers on the bottom. This uses sound waves, thousands of pulses a second, to see in 3D in real time what the divers are doing. Now, look over here in the water, back towards the ship here. You see the big hook and the straps going down in the water? This is attached to a crane, and the divers on the bottom right now are utilizing nylon straps and a steel I-beam to hook up the artifact, in this case a, a piece of the Georgia's engine machinery. They're hooking it up to this and that crane will lift it out of the water very slowly. Now, you know, when you're doing this kind of work, it's very unpredictable. Currents change, uh, visibility changes, and sometimes you might, and, and again, you can see about this far in front of your face. When you're down there working on these things, it looks one way, and when you start to lift it off the bottom, it can look another. You have to be very careful uh, not to break the artifact when you're raising it, so it's a real slow process. The divers work as fast as they can because time is money and millions of dollars of government resources are on the line here, but they work no faster than they can work safely. So again, we're looking at uh, about half a dive barge here, the sonar, the crane, and it looks like we may have something happening in just a second. We'll see if we can find out here. You about to raise the hook? Not yet. Not yet, okay. You're not going to raise the hook yet. Let's go inside. Let me show you something else. Watch your step here. Watch my cameraman, Will. Come this way one second. Let the chief diver go past. We're going to walk this way. Now this, uh, basically it's a tent. It's like we're camping out here, but this is not a, uh, this is not a KOA. <laughs> This is basically the command center for everything that happens here. And I'm uh, lowering my voice in case folks are working. So uh, we got readjusted to the light here. This is a place, and I'm also going to stop for a second and pull your, go ahead, Will, walk forward. I'm going to pull you some cable in here. All right, looks like that's all we got. Okay. So the folks in here are uh, monitoring some of the same feeds that we showed you at the other station in our previous uh, shot. Uh, this is the uh, USBL diver tracking system, and again, it's a map of the road. Now, introduce yourself to the folks who are watching and tell us what you're doing here. I'm Will Wilson, and I'm providing support for the uh, USBL system. I've got the GIS up right now, and it's got a database of all the artifacts and uh, the sketches we've done over the course of the project. And GIS stands for what? Geographic Information System. And is that satellite-based? Uh, well, the original location data was satellite-based, yes, and then the USBL position beyond that. Now, Will, can you zoom in? And I'm going to ask you to kind of show on screen here with your finger. I see these, these little dots. Can you just tell us what these are and how this works? These are the large artifacts we have here. Each of these dots represents uh, one of the larger artifacts we located before. Uh, and all of these will be acquiring during this process. Um, this is the target they're going for right now. It's the condenser. The condenser is the piece of the steam engine machinery of the CSS Georgia. Correct. So now, are you actually monitoring something, or are you just entering information into your database based on what the, the divers tell us as they do their work? Right. This is not real time. I'm just, this is support for this system, which is monitoring what the divers are doing currently. So this is just everything that we've put in. Okay, very cool. All right, let's move over here now. Uh, this looks very familiar, same kind of stuff, but um, I don't know if... Tell us who you are and what you're doing and <laughs> so the folks at home can. My name is Andrew Lidecker and I'm a maritime archaeologist with Pan American and I'm running the GPS navigation system for the project which has GPS positioning and we have acoustic positioning for the diver locations so that we can get them to the location they need to be at for the particular artifact we're trying to recover. Okay, and I'm going to take this off since we're inside now. Okay. High fashion here. Can you, and again, acoustic just means sonar because it's sound. 
Yes, it's it's a it's it's not a sonar per se, but it is an acoustic. It uses an acoustic signal to locate the diver, and we have it. We have a, a transceiver over the side of the barge at this location here, and that basically creates a three-dimensional acoustic grid under the dive vessel, and it can position. There's a beacon on each diver or each piece of equipment we want to track, and that basically. Uh, the beacon responds to a request for a signal by the transceiver, and the transceiver then can use that signal to locate it in that three-dimensional grid under the boat, and then we have a real-time location from the global positioning system feed that we have. All right, I'm gonna, I've been here a few days, I understand what you're saying. I'm going to transition this into the eighth-grade English that I normally speak. So uh, can we, actually, let me tell you, basically what he's saying is the, uh, the sonar that is being utilized there actually transmitters for USBL on the diver's back. So the divers are sending out a, a real-time signal on their own equipment, on their back, that tells us where they are. So what we're looking at here on the screen, uh, these brown, well, actually this kind of tan thing is a piece of the iron armored side or casemate of the wreck. The green is just relief on the bottom, hard clay topography that stands out. And these little circles, these are the divers, right? Yes. Or are these, uh, the black ones are the yes. artifact? This circle with the dot in it is the I-beam that's on the crane that they're going to use to lift the piece of the, uh, uh, of the wreck that they're looking at right now. And the circle with the X in it is Green Diver. He's one of the divers. We only have one. We're only tracking one of the divers. And this is the, the sonar transmitter, is that correct? Yeah, it's the transceiver that's on a pole over the side. And this, this dark rectangle here is the barge that we're, that we're sitting on. So we're standing about right there. Yes. Okay. We're, right, we're directly over the largest section of the wreck. All right. Well, so cool. All right. I want to thank you. Let's see. I want to show the folks the map of the wreck, and I don't think we have enough cable to go that way. So let's see if we can carefully walk this way without tripping and uh, breaking ourselves or any equipment. So now I feel like a weather forecaster here. Uh, we've got a cold front moving in from the Civil War right here. Now, in actuality, this is just a large-scale reproduction of the the map, if you will, of the uh, wreck site that archaeologists have created. So this is the South Carolina side of the Savannah River. Fort Jackson would be over here off the map. Here, again, the largest piece of wreckage, the iron casemate side. Another piece here. And if you can see these, there's like a grid or a checkerboard here. The divers and archaeologists gridded off the entire wreck site during the course of their work uh, over the last few years here. And they have created a rough map, that GIS map that we learned about, of every single thing that they have located that they're aware of on the bottom. And obviously, in six inches of visibility with only maximum two or three dives a day, you can't know everything that's there and more things will be found. But this is basically a very accurate representation of what they have. Each of the white X's uh, were unexploded ordnance, cannonballs and shells that they were aware of at the beginning of this dive. And again, as you heard, uh, this few dozen actually turned into more than a hundred when the, the dives began. And here, cannons. Uh, there may have been up to 10 cannons aboard the CSS Georgia at any given time, but and two of those cannons were raised in the 1980s and are on exhibit uh, at Fort Jackson, Old Fort Jackson National Historic Landmark in Savannah. Uh, at the time that this recovery effort started, there were four cannons remaining on the Georgia. Over here by this casemate section, cannon one. Down here, in the midst of, uh, not surprisingly, surrounded by cannonballs, cannon four over here. And this one, let me, let me go back to cannon four. What do you think makes this a, a, a challenging cannon to dive on? Well, here's the shipping channel. So you're on a slope close to the edge uh, where the ships go past. It makes it, you had to be very careful and they actually had to move the barge over to get within a safe distance for the divers to operate. Here's cannon three, cannon two. Now, one of the really cool things that's been raised so far and the most iconic and recognizable piece of wreckage was the CSS Georgia's big iron propeller. Uh, experts think it probably had two propellers based on the construction and shape and layout of the propeller that we do have. It would have possibly gone in circles if it only had that one. Well, the, the one surviving propeller that we know of was right here and that was raised yesterday and it was so cool. So basically the barge sits here and they just lift up one thing after another. Now this was done in sections. It started out with uh, the, well, 
starting in January, phase one of the effort began, and archaeologists working for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers raised 1,600 small artifacts, everything from cannon sights and bayonet handles to uh, personal glass dishes that the officers would have used, and even some prehistoric Native American pottery that must have washed into the site. So just kind of a grab bag of uh, archaeological delights out there. Well, then the U.S. Navy comes and puts the big barge on site, the hard hat divers start working, and they bring up those more than 100 cannonballs and then the four cannons. Now the cannons are considered explosive too. Why? Why is a bullet, if a bullet's not in a gun, why is the gun dangerous? Well, because when the George's crew intentionally sank her to keep her out of General Sherman's hands, they spiked the guns. This is to render them useless to the enemy in case they're recovered when you leave. Spiking it means a couple of things. You hammer a nail into the little vent hole where you pull the lanyard out to shoot the cannon, and then you take a shell, you put a black powder charge, make the cannon uh, hot, and then you ram a shell in backwards. So it's a booby trap cannon that could blow up at any time. So bringing those cannons off the bottom was delicate. They brought them up, let them hover in the air a second. All of us who were here who were not you know, necessary to the job of bringing that cannon on board were sent off onto a boat 200 feet away and they gently lowered it to the deck. And the dangerous part is when that cannon was coming down because a bounce contact with the deck could have blown it up. Nothing happened, everybody was safe. That's the wreck site. So let's go back outside very carefully and I want to show you some more of the things that are happening out here. And I'm going to grab my hard hat because it's not cool to be on TV doing dangerous things unless you're on a reality show. All right, hard hat on, okay, we good? Now, I don't know, do we have enough? <laughs> Come over here with me, viewers, we're gonna show you the reality of television. We're making sure we have enough cable. That's right, I'm the reporter who helps, okay? All right, so, <laughs> over here, stop right there, Will, let me show people, because we need to back up a little bit, we're under the crane. Uh, this is the crane that actually lifts the artifacts. See, it's, uh, I couldn't tell you how high it is, how tall it is, but it's tall. And then again, coming down uh, into the water where they've got a hook over the artifacts. And, uh, okay, you see the orange thing? It's, let's, let me tell you what this is before it gets loud, and then I'm gonna walk over and show you. Uh, the, are we foggy or are we looking good? Okay, when we come out of the air conditioning out here on the river, the camera's just frost up, like uh, when you walk outside and your glasses fog up. The orange thing over there, is a high pressure pump. It blows water out fast and hard so that you can use it to kind of spray under the artifacts and blast out any sediment or mud that's uh, caked up there. Let's go take a look at it. It may get too loud for me to talk to you, but I, so I wanted to tell you what it is first. I'm gonna go behind to make sure we have enough cable here. back this way anyway, I can't hear myself. So uh, without going too much further, come this way, Will. If you look back around this way, uh, come over here. This gives you a sense of uh, kind of the size and the composition of the dive barge. Again, down on the other end are the divers that we uh, watched and listened to earlier operating off the side. In the middle, the metal container buildings that have the sonar and the other computers and where they're monitored. So let's, let's cross over this way. I want to show what's behind you, Will get a little bit of distance here. The red buoy there, that red buoy is all that has marked the uh, resting place of the CSS Georgia for the last few decades. It's basically been the marker. It's, it's a channel marker that tells harbor pilots and ship's captains, stay clear of me. Uh, I'm special. Don't bump into me. But one of the things that's happened over the years is many times the Georgia has been impacted by harbor dredging, uh, ship strikes, 
The ship was sunk by its own crew in December of 1864. We know from written historical accounts that there were salvage attempts to uh, pull up some of the metal to use for, uh, to sell and use for other purposes. They even used dynamite to do that. So the Georgia was probably pretty damaged right after she went down. Uh, the mayor of Savannah, Edward C. Anderson, a former Confederate officer in the city, talks about how there was some of it sticking up out of the water, uh, but eventually it just vanishes from the maps. We also know that the river was as shallow as 12 to 16 feet at sometimes in the not too distant past. So it was in the, the uh, 20th century we begin really deepening the river, and that is probably when the Georgia starts to be seriously damaged. So if you can pan over to your left, um, if it's not too bright, Right over there, uh, behind uh, the, the crane's hook and strap, that's Old Fort Jackson. Now, the Georgia was here because it was part of a network of defensive uh, fortifications that defended Savannah from Union attack. So you had Fort Jackson, a brick fort over there with powerful cannons. Over here on the South Carolina side, uh, you had uh, a dirt battery, a mud battery, an earthen fortification. And then here in the middle of the river was the CSS Georgia. Flat side out, bristling with cannons facing down river. There were also mines, called torpedoes, but essentially explosive mines in the river, a chain stretched across, sunken ships, all kinds of obstructions. It made it nearly impossible for any Union warship to come up and attack Savannah. That's why Georgia was here, and that's why she sank right beneath us. Let's walk back over this way and take another look at what's happening on this side. And we are being very careful, and I'm helping because we're dragging cable uh, in a very industrial, very fast-paced uh, environment. And we're being careful, and so are all the people who are around us. Just one last look here. Again, the uh, the facilities where folks are controlling the dives. And then over here again, the diver station. And uh, this will be our last stop as we talk about the CSS Georgia. So again, a uh, multifaceted, uh, very high tech effort to raise this historic warship and also a lot of uh, experience and know-how on the part of the world's best military salvage divers. So kind of ironic that after uh, you know, a good three years of uh, evading the United States Navy. It's now the U.S. Navy that's coming here to save this uh, very rare and very special warship. Thank you for joining us. Um, we'll be back in the future, not too far down the road, to tell you more about what's happening. It's happening quickly. Uh, not fast enough for history lovers, but as fast as can safely be done. Thanks for joining us. I'm Michael Jordan, reporting from the CSS Georgia Dive Barge in Savannah.